I don't know if you've ever tried to pick up the Bible and slug your way through it, reading it all. And it probably starts off pretty interesting in Genesis, right? You get some cool stuff happening, and you get a little part way into Exodus, and it's okay. But if you've ever tried to read the whole thing all the way through, you probably got bogged down by the second uh, book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, when it started saying stuff like this. Uh, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim. You shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be twenty-eight cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtains and on and on it goes <laughs> for like twenty chapters, right? And uh, since I knew the kids were going to be in with us today, I thought I'd do a little bit, something a little bit different today and talk through this whole tabernacle-y thing that Moses did and what it means to you and I, oh, 3,450 years later and how it fits with us. It's an interesting passage. I, I love kind of what, what happens in the whole um, understanding of the tabernacle because it, it starts off this big snoozer chapter and you read in, you're starting to read this and go, oh, I, I just, this thing is just kind of laying there. But when it starts, it starts off really cool. Because it starts off in chapter 24, where God says, now, God says to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. That's the high priest, Aaron, and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu. And 70 of the elders of Israel, you come up and worship the, uh, from afar. And Moses alone came near the Lord. So the whole group of 70 and the High priest and his two sons came, but Moses gets a little closer. They come up down to the mountain where God's hanging out, and uh, Moses goes even further, closer to the Lord. And he says, but uh, the people, the general people, sh should not go. They let them stay down. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the judgments, and all the people answered the one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do, we will do. It says, uh, then Moses, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel saw the God of Israel. And there was under his seas that were a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. So this group of leaders of Israel come up to the, high up on the mountain, and they sit there, and they have this little dinner, and in the dinner party, they actually see God in front of them, like hosting the table. And it's amazing because it says God didn't kill them. That's what it means when he didn't lay his hand on them. They stayed alive. And then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone, the law and the commandments, which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. So everybody's about halfway up the mountain now. Moses and Joshua go up even further. Uh, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you, and if a man has a difficulty, let them go to them. So basically, leave those two guys in charge. It says, Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days, and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days, forty nights. So Moses goes high up into this fiery, burning cloud up on the mountain. Everybody's left behind. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he's up there. And while he's up there, God tells him, I want you to build a tabernacle. It's the first ever kind of church, the temple that they're going to worship in. And so I'll describe to you what, what he said to build. It started with a box. God says, build this box. It was not like this, a little bit bigger than this one, actually. And it was made out of acacia wood, which is like a mahogany, about two and a half feet wide, three and a half feet long two and a half feet tall. And they build it out of like solid mahogany wood and then they inlay the whole thing with gold, totally cover it with solid gold inside and outside. And then they make a lid to go over the top of the box and, and I'm going to need you, and I'm going to need you. Come up here a second. Yeah, come up here a second. Come on up here. One of you sit on each chair, okay? And so he says, yeah, right here, sit right there, sweetheart. Perfect, perfect. And so he, there's this box and picture it, solid gold instead of plastic, which is what I can afford, <laughs> and over the box and on the lid, he put two angels, right, and these are your wings, and you can make them so they're comfortable, okay, he put two angels on the lid, and they're actually cherubim, and you always see the pictures, it's like human form bowing down, but actually cherubim were the, like, had the body of a combination of ox and lion, face of a man, big high wings, 
And the cherubim were actually the lid. And so they were on the lid. And when the lid went on, the cherubim's faces, your wings are folding, baby. Here we go. Your, their faces bent down towards the box like a bowed down position. This box had a, two jars of manna in it. And it had this rod that Aaron used that budded because it was a, it was a conflict of who's going to be in charge. And Aaron's staff actually budded almond blossoms. And I'm like, oh, I guess God's with him. That goes in there, and the stone tablets with the original Ten Commandments, that, or the second, actually, copy of the Ten Commandments, go in there. That's what's in the box. The box is called the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, yes, the one that, uh, uh, from the movies, right? <laughs> it's made to melt Nazis' faces. No. <laughs> what happens is, the glory of the Lord sits here. This is actually the very throne of God. God's throne right here. This is where God will sit. It's where God will rule from the people. It is the actual throne that he will rest on. And the angels, the cherubim, are on the lids called the mercy seat. So it's the place where God's going to work with his people. So the next thing that he says is, okay, after the box is built, uh, let's see, I need a couple guys with chairs. Let's see. Um, can you come up here a second and bring your chair? And Can you come up here and bring your chair? And so they make the tabernacle out of this out of uh, thread that is woven together. And it's got to be blue and scarlet and purple thread, all woven together. These are God's sort of colors. I'm going to put you right about here, okay? And you sit right opposite over here, just on the outside, maybe a little bit wider even, just about out here. Okay, and uh, Emma, I need your help. So, Emma, you take some tape here, which I have, and take three stands and tape it to the wall, and wrap it around here and let this little guy hold an end of it, okay? I'll uh, take all three stands, tape it to the wall, let him hold an end of it, and then do the same over here and let this little guy hold an end of it. And then, so the whole work is being done, and so the whole tent is being made with all this blue and scarlet and purple thread. And then they placed this big, thick curtain. It's about four inches thick, actually, but I'm just going to use this for an example. And the big, thick curtain was made out of blue and purple and scarlet thread, too. And the blue and purple and scarlet thread was, for some reason, really meaningful to God. Those are the colors God wanted. That's what he wanted the whole look to be. So it's his command telling him what to build. And you hold this corner. Up oh, high, good. There we go. And you hold this corner. Whoops. Hang on. Hang on. Get, get your grip on there. Get your grip on there. There we go. And you hold this corner. Kind of hold it up high. There we go. If you have to tighten it, you can. Tighten it up a little bit. Good grip. Now you can let go. <laughs> All right. Hold it like there. Now it'll be good. Okay. So there was a curtain called the veil. And the Ark of the Covenant was inside this little blue and purple and scarlet tent that they made. And then they covered the whole thing with red dyed ram's hide and over that a layer of porpoises, porpoise skins, like this giant tent. And the whole thing could come apart. And this place was called the Holy of Holies. Nobody could go into that place except the high priest. And he was only allowed to go in there once a year. And it was the Day of Atonement when they sacrificed a red heifer and then they would take the blood of that heifer, and he could go back behind the veil, behind the four-inch thick curtain, and he could sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and that was to atone for the sins of the nation, done once a year on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. Otherwise, nobody went in there. And it got so much that even in history, they got so afraid of the glory and the power and the presence of God, that what ended up happening is someone decided, well, what if the people are incredibly sinful, and the priest, something happens, and he goes back in there like he has a heart attack or an aneurysm, and he dies. They couldn't figure out, so they put little bells and tassels on the priest's robe so they could hear him behind the veil, so they would know if he's still moving around in there. And then they decide, well, even if he does die, who can go in and get him? So they said, you're going to die if you go in. So they started to tie a rope around his ankle, and as long as they heard the bells, nothing. If they ever heard the bells you know, on this robe, stop moving. Well, he's dropped dead. Maybe he got struck down by God. They could drag his body out, and nobody would go back in there into the Holy of Holies. This was the throne of God, the most sacred, holy place that there was. And when they finally built the real temple out of stone in Solomon's day, about 400 years later, they would build this exact same pattern. And so let's see. I'm going to move you, I'm going to move you back just a little bit. So I'm going to need some room up here. So that's the Holy of Holies. Good. Hang on to that because I'm going to need three more people. Three more people with chairs. Bonnie, let me use you. Uh, let's see. I'm, well, let's just start with one piece at a time here. Bring your chair. Bring your chair with you, Bonnie. Because the next thing, just outside, uh, I'm going to let you okay, yeah, put your chair right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me find this, that, and these. Okay. Mm. Bonnie, I'm going to put you right here, face out. Okay, right outside the veil 
was another little table built of acacia wood, solid like a mahogany, and it was completely covered in gold as well. Oh, and by the way, they put rings on the box, on all four sides. They put rings on this table, and they would slide poles in them because sometimes they had to travel when they were wandering the desert for 40 years. God would move. They'd need to move with them. Nobody could touch these, these um, tables and things. They were holy. They were purified. They were sanctified by God. And so they would take these long poles made of acacia wood covered in gold. They would slide them through the rings, and then they would lift them up onto their shoulders, and the priests would carry these things as they needed to move from one place to another. So right outside the curtain was a little incense table. So I want you to pick one of these incenses, your choice, or two. You stick the narrow end in there, and then light up the other end till we get some fragrance going in the room. Okay? The incense table was a special incense that was made out of cinnamon, and it had myrrh in it, and it had some frankincense, and it had all this other kinds. It was a special recipe by God. And God said, this incense has to burn continually in front of me every day, 24 hours a day, night and day. It can never go out. So priests had to come in, and they had to set the incense, and they had to light it. And the recipe was so unique that all of the different tables and all of the different ornaments and all the dishes and plates that they would use in here were all anointed with this fragrance, with this oil. And God said, you cannot make that particular recipe for anything else ever. It can't be used in regular life. It can't be used as a perfume. That specific recipe of the cinnamon and the frankincense and the myrrh and some of the other spices that were in there, that was only for the inside of the holy place. So there's a candle, and we have you light that up. There you go. Get it burning. Is that not going to fit? That's crazy. Maybe it goes sideways like this, sometimes like that, and see if that works. Or you can always pick another one. <laughs> so that seems too big for that. See if the other ones fit. Oh, that's frankincense, too. That's not bad. Little Frank, so it would burn. The altar of incense represented the prayers of the people. It was the prayers that would go up. The smoke would continually burn and go up and up and up and up. And that recipe was so unique. And God said, don't ever put any other kind of fragrance on her. This is holy. And at one point, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, decided, ah, God, Shmod, what does he know? And they came in and the scriptures say they burned strange incense on the altar. In other words, they screwed up the recipe. They didn't do it right. They weren't treating it seriously. Oh, you've got one. Go ahead. Give that to her. And uh, they, they lit a different kind of incense on this little table right here. And woof, God struck them both dead. And their father, Aaron, was not allowed uh, to mourn them. They had to carry them outside the camp and dump their bodies because they had so disrespected God and disrespected his rules. So this altar of incense sat there. There you go. Good job. All right. So, um, Let's see, I need one more person who can come and be... Yeah, let me have you, Sophie. Come up here, bring your chair. Bring your chair, and I want you to sit right here. Atta girl. There was another gold table right here. And on this particular gold table, it was about the same, a little bit longer than the altar of incense, and it was a little bit longer. On it, they would place... Take those out of that bag. And then when you're done with that, take all of them out. There you go. And put them on the, put them on the plate. Good, good, good. And I'll put those on there, and you count them for me and tell me how many you have. Got them all? Sophie, how many are there? Twelve. This was called the table of showbread. So every single day, a loaf of bread was brought in and placed on the table, and the old ones taken out and the new ones brought in. And there was always 12 of them every single day. The real ones were way bigger than this. They were made out of an unleavened bread, so they were flat like this. But the real ones were about that big around and about that thick. And so each, each particular showbread was placed on the table, and every day they would change it out. And they would put in fresh bread, and then the old bread the priest got to eat. But continually, forever before the Lord, there had to be 12 loaves of bread sitting on the table. Why 12? 12 tribes of Israel. One loaf of bread for each tribe. So what's it demonstrating? It was God's way of telling these tribes that, hey, I provide for you. I take care of your needs, the most basic need of food even. All the needs you have to stay alive and sustain your life, I'm the God who provides for you. I take care of you. And each one of those loaves of bread represented a tribe of Israel. And each tribe, God was saying, I'm the one who takes care of you. I'm the one who meets your needs. Every single day, fresh, I take care of you. I know what's going on in your life. I know what hurts you have. I know what pains you have. And I'm still there for you, providing for you. So every day, the table of showbread would be there. At one point in history, King David was on the run when King Saul was trying to kill him, and he came to the courtyard where the temple had been set up, and he said, do you have any food? And they said, we don't have any at all. we got nothing. Everything's been eaten. All we have is the table of showbread, and the old bread's just coming off, and the new bread's coming on. He said, well, can I have some? And the priest gave it to David. 
which was kind of an interesting thing because it was technically against the law. It was supposed to only go to the priests. But later on, Jesus would say that was a good thing that happened, that, that even in a time of desperate need, the, the need of life took precedence over the religious law. Kind of an interesting thing. So solid gold, table of showbread, incense, holy of holies, Ark of the Covenant with a cherubim hanging over it. One more table right here. This one's going to need to be someone a little bit older. Let me see who we could use. That's a little, doesn't have to be a little, I don't know. It can actually even be an adult person. I'm going to use you, Shelly. <laughs> All right. And the reason I'm going to use you is because this, this one's got some fire to play with. What's that? What fell down there? Nothing? Okay. All right. Oh, oh, something else I forgot to, to add to it. The curtain and the veil and all of the temple was covered with angels that had been worked into the fabric. So, Emma, can you tape angels across our curtains so we understand that's what's going on? Just pull me four or five. Hang on to this because we're going to need this. Shelly, have a seat about right here. And you hold those for now. And just tape some of those. Just let me get out of the way a second. And I need this and I need this. No, hold the curtain up. We're going to keep that. There we go. There was a seven-branched lampstand. Now, I couldn't find a really good one. All you can find anymore are nine-branched candlesticks. They're called menorahs, right, which is kind of weird because technically this is not a menorah. When it has nine, it's a Hanukkah candle. When it has seven, it's a true menorah, right? So hold that. And I'm not even sure these candles are going to fit in there because they're the only ones I could find, and let's find out. Oh, yeah, baby. I want you to put seven of them in there and light them up. And all I could find were birthday candles, which wouldn't be right. This, this candlestick, oh, there you go, Emma. This candlestick actually was a seven branch. It had a single stand that would come out, and then a branch of pear, and then another pear, and then another pear, and a single one in the middle. And they were almond blossom clusters, and an almond blossom, and an almond blossom. The thing was made out of about 80 pounds of solid gold. And it was an oil lamp, so they would put oil in it, and then they would put the wicks in each one, and that thing would burn continually, night and day. They always had it, and there was a special consecrated oil that they had to use. Couldn't just use any old regular oil. And, uh, yeah, you know what you can do is melt some wax in the bottom. You can just stand up straight if you want to. Or choose it. I just laid one on your lap. There's a lighter right there for you. <laughs> Poof, right? Put some wax in the bottom, light them up. So the seven-branched menorah was always burning. So why are there nine in a Hanukkah candle? right? Everybody knows the seven-branch menorah, because what happened centuries later, the temple had been destroyed. There was this huge war of the Maccabees overthrowing Antiochus Epiphanes, this descendant of the armies of Alexander the Great. And when the Maccabees took over, the temple had been ransacked, destroyed. Everything is, it was kind of uh, left in disarray, and they uh, found the seven-branched candlestick called the menorah. They set it up inside the temple again, trying to clean out and make things holy, and they didn't have enough oil to get the thing started. They had enough for maybe one day's supply. So they poured the oil into it anyway while they went about going and manufacturing and getting more oil. They lit the menorah on, uh, they, they got it going, lit it up inside the holy place. And lo and behold, for eight days, the oil kept burning even though it was a one day supply. So it's considered a miracle by the Jews saying this is God's way of saying he wants us to return to the pure and true holy worship of him. And he's had this one day of supply of oil last for eight days. So now a a Hanukkah candle has eight uh, branches, so to speak, and one for the original wick that lights. And they celebrate it as the festival of lights, but it's celebrating this light that was continually on. What this means, it's hard to tell. There's a seven-branch candlestick somehow there, and it's always got the light, and it's solid gold, 80 pounds. You have the acacia wood incense table covered in gold. You have the showbread table, acacia wood covered in gold. You have the acacia Ark of the Covenant with the solid gold lid with the cherubim leaning over it. This is the Holy of Holies. And where's the rest of our streamers? You got more streamers? You got my streamers? Okay, I got more. I got more. So what we want to do then is we want to take our streamers... And uh, actually, don't even cut them. Take them from him. Oh, you got three right there. Here, you, you take these three. And we're going to bring them out even further, if we can. Eh, we're darn close. Let's tape them to the chair here. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. As good as part as we can. All right. You got that, Emma? So this little room here, and actually it would have been more like 20 feet by 30 feet. This room here is called the holy place. This is where the priest could come in, and they changed the bread, and they lit the incense. They could work in here. Only the priest could come in here. No regular person could come in here. No, not even Moses could come in here. This was only for the high priest and his attendants. And what would happen is their names would get drawn. You had to come from the tribe of Levi. You couldn't come from any other tribe. 
the tribe of Levi was the only ones that were priests, and in there they were trained all their lives to be priests, but you only got to serve here if your number was drawn by lottery. And it took you till you were your 30th birthday before you were even eligible. So when your number was drawn by lottery, you could finally come and serve in here. And so some priests spent their whole life and their name never got drawn. They never served here. Others may have served two or three times. They would come in to the Holy of Holies, they, or the, the Holy Place. They couldn't go to the Holy of Holies, but they could come to the Holy Place. And here they did their work. This is the place, and this is in the temple, when this guy named Zechariah, he comes in, his name is drawn, he comes in, and his job is to light the incense on this table, and he has this angel appear to him, woof, and says, you're going to have a son, and your son will be John the Baptist. I want you to name him John, and he's going to be the forebearer of the Messiah, and after him will come someone even greater. Well, Zachariah is an old guy, and he doesn't have any kids, so he's like, uh, how do I know this is going to even happen? I mean, I'm an old man. I'm past the point of having kids now, right? I should have had kids 30, 40, 50 years ago. And the angel basically says, I'll prove it to you. You'll have the kid next year. And because you disbelieved, you'll be struck dumb for a year. And so for one year, he couldn't speak. And finally, the child's born. And all of his friends say, what do you want to name the child? And of course, in their culture, you always name the first child after the father. Always. And then the second child, the, well, if it was a boy. And then you would name the kids accordingly to who was in the family. And so they ask Zechariah, what should we name this kid that just got born? He says, his name is John. And he writes it on this tablet, and his mouth is open, and he can speak again because that was his sign of faith. That's what was going on, lighting incense at this table in the tabernacle. So picture this tent here. So we have the holy place, the holy of holies, the veil is up. Uh, let's see, menorah, the lampstand. You have the incense, the showbread, Ark of the Covenant. And then the next thing you would have, if you walked outside this little tent, was another courtyard. Now, technically, do we have enough streamer to get from him to her? To, to All right, so what I want you to do is take three streamers and tape them. Let's just tape them to the stand where the speaker is. And we're going to run them all the way back there to, oh, maybe where Brian is or maybe Margo. Okay? And then do it again on this side. From this speaker stand, three colors of the streamers, and we'll run them back there to that handsome gentleman in the back with the, with the nice goatee. I like that. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, okay. So... Um, all three colors, again, the same thing. Angels, angels, angels everywhere, right? So, Emma, when you're done doing the streamers, maybe somebody could help her with the streamers on this side. Anybody? You want help, Joey? Cool. Wait, here we go. We're going to run yours right back to Margo. Straight back. Joey, take him doing this side. Anna, is there another roll of tape in there? Ah, oh, that's perfect. Give it a toss. All right, Joey, there's your tape. And this is going to be the actual tabernacle, all right? And are the angels up there somewhere? The yellow angel paper in the box. It's in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so what we want to do then is let's just uh, have a few of you along the edge. You can do that. You hold one. How many have I got? Three or four. You guys take one. Let's bring a couple over here. I'm almost out of them. Any more inside the box, Anna? You take one of those. Here, you take one of those. So the whole work, just hold it up when I ask you to. So what's going to happen is all the fabric that was on the sides good 10, 15 feet tall, was covered. It was woven fabric made out of goat's hair, very fine, twisted linen. It was all twisted, so if you can twist those, that makes it even better. And uh, Yeah, but you'll get the idea. And then it was had the angels going all the way around. So you came out. The next thing would be actually the setup. Let's see. I need one volunteer right here. All right, come here, sweetheart. Right here, I need you to sit in this chair. They made this huge bronze bowl. Sit right there, hold the bowl up, and it was a wash basin. And I'm going to put some water in there so don't go sloshing around, okay? So there you go. There's some water in that. Oh, here we go. And so they had this huge wash basin, and it was giant. And it was made out of all the mirrors of the women. They had come out of Egypt with all this gold, and of course, in those days, they didn't have glass. So they used super polished bronze. That's how women would see their reflection. And they needed hundreds and hundreds of them to make this giant, like, massive bowl that was going to be the bronze um, labor out here. And so all the women donated their mirrors and they made this giant bronze bowl filled with water. This is where the priests would come and they would wash themselves in this water. They would wash out all that they were co completely covered. So, so before they came into the holy place, before they came into the holy place, they had to be washed clean. And you were washed clean with the water. And then, of course, the high priest once a year could go into the holy of holies. So the bronze labor was there. Then there was one more station just outside a little further along, and it was called the Altar of Sacrifice. 
So further out here was a giant bronze, it was a big square box, uh, about 12 feet by 12 feet, had kind of a grate over the top. And this is where they would tie an offering on. Who's going to be my altar of sacrifice person? All right, come over here, buddy. You're in. Right there on the seat. All right, and you hold that up. Now, they would usually use a ram. Go ahead and get on the seat if you can. They would use a ram or a goat or a bull or whatever. The, depends on how big the sin was and how rich you were. But they would always slaughter an animal here. And who's ever butchered an animal before, like a cow or a... All right, yeah. Okay, I have too. Let me tell you something. It ain't pretty. If you're wondering, it ain't pretty, right? It's a little bit difficult, and you got to kind of suck it up, and you got to do it. And, you know, it also what kind of bothers me is it ain't instant. And what they would actually do is they would slit the animal, they would tie the animal to the altar, and they would slit its throat here until the blood drained out. And the blood would drain out all over the, and then they could butcher the beast, and then they would set off certain parts here and certain parts there. They would burn some on the altar. They would burn some of the meat to God as a fragrant aroma, and the rest would be distributed back to the family. Some went to the priests. Uh, some went to the person who made the sacrifice. And typically it meant that if you had a sacrifice like that, you threw a rather lavish celebration because, hey, I just, I just sacrificed a whole uh, ox on the altar. What am I going to do with the meat? I'll throw a party. So oftentimes they, they turned into big celebrations, but the idea was the priests were the ones who were the butchers. The priests were the ones who made all this happen. The priests were the ones who had to do the altar of sacrifice, and then they had to come and wash themselves, and then they would serve in here. So you get the whole image is kind of this enclosed thing. What it's saying is God's living with you. And then the rest of the rules God got were this. There's 12 tribes of Israel. They actually were stationed in groups of three. So three tribes always camped on this side. Three tribes always camped on that end. Three tribes always camped this way and three this way. So the tribes were actually stationed around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the center of society. It was the center of where they went. So for 40 years, they're going to travel around the desert, and this is the center of society. And you can understand the whole image and the picture. Now, who in here is actually your ethnically Jewish? One ethnically Jewish person. All right. Rachel, you would be the only person allowed to get this close to God. In this whole room, none of us Gentiles were ever allowed to get this close to God. The closest any of us Gentiles could get was visiting the camps on the outside. We could never come into the temple of God. We could never come into this holy place. God had reserved it for the chosen ones. He had set it aside. And not even Rachel could get real far, because, sorry to say, but you're a woman. And the laws were such that the men could, you could get about to the altar of sacrifice as far as you're going to get. But you had to achieve this sense of holiness and righteousness. See, God was trying to explain to his people, I'm holy, I'm righteous, I'm not to be trifled with. I'm not to be uh, uh, mistaken as just a God who's like, yeah, that'll do. Oh, that's okay. He was trying to say, I'm separate from anything you've ever known. And then he was also saying, I live right here with you. I am in your midst. I'm right beside you all the time, but I'm untouchable. But you can't get close to me. I'm with you, and yet I'm far from you. And so it was an interesting dilemma that they were all in, trying to figure this whole situation out, the tabernacle with all the angels around it, and they could see it every day. And then it's, it's really fascinating is when you get to the, um, to the idea that God is their king, it says in Exodus 25, verse 22, it says, God is saying this to Moses, you come and meet with me at the testimony. There I will meet with you and I will speak with you from the mercy seat from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So Moses, when it came time for him to say, how do we know what God wants us to do? How, how do we know what God's laws are? I get a difficult case to try it. How do I know who's guilty and who's innocent? Moses could come here. He couldn't go behind the curtain. But God would be sitting there on the box, and he would, could ask God, and God would actually answer him sitting right there. And so this was how the whole society was structured. This is how it ran. And so Moses would then go out. He would normally use his wisdom to judge his case here and fix, solve a crime there, figure out what they wanted, figure out some of the religious laws. But whenever he wasn't sure, he could actually come in and talk directly with God on the other side of the veil. And God would tell him what he wanted. And God would speak to them, and he would, could lead the people that way. Uh, let's see, a couple other things I want to mention about this. Uh, okay, yeah, Exodus 40. So when Mount, Moses is up on that mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, what's happening is he's getting this image. God is revealing this to him. God's saying, this is, this is what I want you to build, and this is how I want you to make it. 
This is every, and then later on, God would anoint people with special powers of craftsmanship and the ability to weave the fabric, to weave the angels in, to make the gold, to uh, do the incense, to make the spices that would go on, to make the little serving bowls. He actually empowered people to have these gifts of spiritually uh, gifted craftsmanship. And so Moses comes down off the mountain. There's a little hullabaloo with a golden calf. That gets sorted out after a few uh, thousand people get killed. And they finally make this whole thing, and they set it up. They get it up. It's set up wooden poles all the way along, wooden poles all the way along, set the sacrifice up. They set the wash basin up. They set up the holy place. They set up the holy of holies. Everything goes inside it like it is. And the moment that it's set up, listen what the scriptures say. Exodus chapter 40, last few verses. It says, And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. And that means under Moses' leadership, the work was finished. Then it says, verse 34, last few verses of the book of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So the day it gets set up, what initially happens is, okay, we're all set up, lamps are lit, incense burning, bread's fresh on the table, mercy seats up, Veil is up. Here we go. Everything's done. And they're like, okay, God. And this huge glory of the Lord goes woof over the top of the whole thing. And it's, when they say cloud, they don't mean like, oh, what a nice, fluffy little cloud. It meant like a fiery, smoky, billowing, you know, full of um, all kinds of just more like smoke that would go out. And peals of thunder and lightning is what they'd seen when God was up on the mountain. So when God's glory rested on it, it was not a comforting thing. It was like, holy smokes, this God is, he, that's where we probably get the phrase, holy smokes, right? <laughs> I'm just thinking, all right? Lance, you were, you were faster than me on that one. And so the whole idea is God, woof, and he, and, he, and he fills it, and it's this, like, giant, burning, kind of cloudish thing. It's so, it's so vast, Moses can't even get in. It's like God's presence is filling the whole thing. Woof, woof, woof. And then, as it kind of lifts up, it hovers right over the holy place. The holy of holies, he hovers there. By day, it's this huge pillar of cloud. By night, of course, they see it as the fire that's inside it. They see it as a pillar of fire. And one morning they would wake up and like, hey, the cloud's four miles away. Sometime in the dead of night, the cloud moved. That meant God moved. Well, if God moved, pack it all up, bring it all down, put the rings in the poles, put the rings in, load it up, carry it. we got to go to where God is. And they would move the thing underneath. And how did they know where God wanted them to camp? They'd see, well, I'm right under the cloud. That's where the box goes. The box goes right under the cloud. Everything else then gets put out accordingly. And this was the whole, and this is what all that Exodus stuff is all about. Now, Here's what's interesting to me. I'm going to need, ah, maybe I'll read it myself. Hebrews chapter 9. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9. And this is what the writer of Hebrews tells us about this whole setup. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. It says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Hebrews 9, verses 20. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels and all the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. When Moses set the tabernacle up, he was told specifically, by the way, this tabernacle is a shadow of the heavenly reality. God had told him, what you're building, 
It's designed this way, and it has the holy throne, and it has the cherubim, and it has this seven-branched uh, menorah, and it has the incense, the smoke of the prayers of people, and it has the showbread, and it has the tabernacle with angels all around. And the reason you're doing this is because this is a replica, although a small, poor replica, of the actual reality of God's real throne room in heaven. And so Moses understood it, and throughout time the Jewish nation understood that this tabernacle isn't just an idea we could change any way we want. Let's do something fresh with it or new with it. They understood God had us do it this way because this is what it actually is in heaven. Although we have a golden lamp standing on with seven branches, I don't know what it is in heaven. We have a golden table burning incense. I don't know what it is in heaven, but what we have is kind of like that. It was all made precious. It was all made powerful. It was all made pure. It was all sanctified. The angels woven into the fabric. Everything was symbolic of this is an earthly picture for you to understand what the throne room of heaven was really like. And that's why he had him set it up this way. When you get to Hebrews, what's interesting is saying this, because you understand this is the access to God. You have to come from the right chosen people to begin with, the ones that God has already stationed outside. You come to the camp, and this is how you reach God. First, there has to be a sacrifice. Something has to die to pay for your sins. Blood must be shed. Death must happen because your sins are dark enough that they need to be covered somehow. And actually it was meant that this animal being sacrificed was representative of you. You would come to God you'd say, I know I deserve death. So instead of me dying, I'm going to put one of my most precious, perfect male animals on here. And the reason it was the males because because a big, strong ram could breed the next herd for you. It could breed all the next generations. It was a true sacrifice for you because you weren't just giving up this one animal. You were giving up all the animals that would come from it. And you laid a perfect animal here. You couldn't bring a spotted, lame one, a blind one. You couldn't give away your leftovers. It had to be the best you had. And when that animal died, you had laid your hands on it. You prayed over it. You prayed yourself and your sins into it so that when it died, you understood that's supposed to be me. And this animal is dying in my place. And the blood that's being shed is the atonement for my sin. Once the blood was shed, then you understood, aha, now I can be washed clean. Now I am capable of having my sins covered. Now I can be made pure and holy and clean. And so you would come to become clean. And then you would come into the place we understood that God provides for me. He takes care of me. God is the one who makes sure that my life's going to work. And somehow the light of God's truth is right here for me to find and discover. This place is always lit. His truth is always before me. And it's a many-faceted truth that can speak to me and open my eyes to what is true and what is real. And then I understood my prayers would go up forever before God. And I could come into this place and I can say, Lord, Lord, tell me about myself. Tell me about who you are. Tell me about me. Tell me about the world around me. And the weird thing is, except for Rachel, none of us as Gentiles have access into this. When Jesus came, what Hebrews is telling us is when Jesus came, when he died on the cross, it was no longer an animal that needed to be sacrificed because the perfect spotless lamb of God was sacrificed instead. And Hebrews tells us that he came and he washed himself clean. Scriptures talk about the washing of water with the word. So when you read your Bible and you're doing what the Bible tells you to do and when you're studying the scriptures, what it's saying is you're actually being washed, cleansed, purified, your mind being focused on what God wants you. You're seeing truth the way God wants you to see it. And that cleansing means you could come in here. And what's interesting is... When Jesus died on the cross in the temple, this four-foot-thick curtain known as a veil, what happened to it? It was torn right down the middle. Interesting, the scriptures say, the moment Jesus died, this four-inch-thick curtain was split in the temple from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. Not from man up, from God down. It was torn and completely ripped open. What does that say about access to God? It was wide open after Jesus. And because of what Jesus did now, all of us Gentiles can walk right past the altar of sacrifice and say, Jesus did that for me. I'm covered under his blood. I don't need to lay another animal on there. I don't need to atone for anything. I don't need to do anything more for my sin. Jesus did it. And I can come to where he washes me clean with his word. And he purifies my mind and my heart, telling me what is true from what is false. God does that at the bronze labor. And I can come in here and I can understand God is providing for me. And the smoke of my prayers are going up there. And the light of God's truth is shining on me. You kind of bow before the ark of the covenant god's throne is right there and i get to say as hebrew says you can come boldly and confidently and you say abba father you say daddy daddy i need to talk that's what this whole thing was about the tabernacle it took generations and years indeed centuries before humankind grasped god is holy 
not to be trifled with, not to be dismissed, not to be toyed with. God is holy. And then after a while, it was like, I don't know how to reach God until Jesus comes. And Jesus doesn't go through the earthly one. He doesn't go through the actual physical temple they had in Jerusalem. It says in Hebrews, he went to the real thing in heaven and did all this. He went to the real thing and laid his life on the altar. And when Jesus, when the veil was torn on earth, the real one was torn in heaven. When he made the sacrifice, he made it on earth. But something was happening in the heavenly realities that would change things forever. We Gentiles now can say, I can call God Daddy because of what Jesus did. I now have confident access to come to him. And all the things that God tried to tell us about himself, and basically what he was telling him in the first ages, I'm right there with you, I'm in your midst, and you can't come close to me. And now, because of what Jesus did, I'm right there with you, I'm in your midst, and you can come boldly right into the Holy of Holies and ask me questions. Not because you're good, but because that's how powerful Jesus was. That's how magnificent Jesus is. And then it says this. I love these scriptures that talk about he's, he sits at the right hand of the Father as our advocate. So we come into the actual throne room of God and we say, God, O Father in heaven, and I'm a little scared of you because you know, you're the fire and cloud and all that. And guess who's sitting right beside him? Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that one's mine, Father. That one's mine. Come on in here, daughter. Come on in here, son. Tell me what you need. Tell me what's going on in your life. Tell me what you want from me. And let me tell you some things about you. Is that cool? Is that like, oh, I get it now. I kind of get the whole Exodus thing. I kind of get the whole tabernacle thing. God was saying so much there, I just got bored (laughs) and quit reading it. But God is saying so much there. And when it says in Scriptures, when it says when we gather together and worship, the angels are present. It's like, oh, all those angels around the side, they were symbolic of something that's an actual spiritual truth that right now here at the gathering house, there's angels in the room. I don't see him. Yeah, your eyes are only made to see certain frequencies of light, so don't even let that bother you, right? There's whole frequencies of the light spectrum you can't see. But God is saying they're here present with you. And that when we come and worship, all these truths of the spiritual reality are present right now here. And Jesus has provided the access to the Father. Does that make you want to worship? Does that make you go, man? So I thought, oh, I could say amen, or we could just sing one song that worships God. And if you'd allow me, let's just do one song. Why don't you stand with us and you guys can move off. Good job. Good job. Thank you. 